All right, let's take some time to go back and really focus in on what free body diagrams and their associated equilibrium equations are really all about. Number one, free body diagram is just a drawing that we have to have in order to do everything else in statics. And that drawing is of a body or a portion of a body that is isolated from everything else that it was uh, connected to. That might be supports, it might what we might call constraints, it might be other pieces that we've pulled away. But, but that body now is like a satellite in space and we've pulled everything else off of it. However, when we've pulled it off, we have to, we must include the effects of the forces that have been removed. Not on what remains on what we took away, but rather what we took away and what it does in terms of forces. And when we do that, we want to think in terms of, not this what you might think of a wheelchair symbol, it's not what this is meant to convey, this is thinking about the Cartesian coordinate system, at least in two dimensions. And that's two translations, x and y, and some sort of rotation. That's a key to be thinking about always sum of forces in the x, sum of forces in the y, and some sort of rotational um, equilibrium, that'd be some of moments about a point. So for instance, this <coughs> set of pliers that we have down here is already a free body diagram. It is completely removed from all constraints, and that would be the fingers, the hands, that are here at the handles, that's why they're called handles, and they're squeezing, pushing on this. If I remove those, then these fictitious things, the red arrows, show up. They're fictitious. Out in real world, you don't see any red arrows like this. Instead, that is just a representation of the effect of the hands that were removed. So this is actually a free body diagram in and of itself. Now when you see a pliers or a sort, some sort of grips, this might even be a bolt cutter kind of uh, situation, use almost always what we're interested in is what's the force in as it compared to the force that we get out uh, gripping the little part that's over here. That's the sole purpose of this little machine. Right? We're going to take a look at at free body diagrams for each and every component of this system and, try, and also thinking about the equilibrium equations that would go along with this because you know note on this free body diagram of the whole system we get nothing useful we already know that whatever we're pushing in at the top is going to equal to what we're pushing in at the bottom and that's all we can get because nothing else has been isolated these are the only two things that we stripped away to create that free body diagram but if we come along and we cut away all this other stuff below, then we get what you see down here on the bottom. So there's a ghostly outline of what we have cut away, and when we pull that off, we have to represent what that would have done to the part that remains. Right? So again, thinking about in terms of X, Y, and rotation, we pull this pin here at A, and if it's frictionless pin, there's no ability to have done anything in terms of rotation. So the only thing we would put here would be an internal effect on the pin of AY and AX, which of course could be resolved into a single force of unknown magnitude in potentially an unknown direction. We'll see in a little bit we actually do know the direction and that is very crucial to how we understand what's going on in the system. But right now, pull the pin, we got AX and AY. Same thing here at C, we pull C, the pin at C, and we only have a CX and a CY, and then we have the part that we're gripping over here at E, and if we're assuming that the jaws are essentially smooth, that there's no friction, then the effect here is only vertical on that particular surface. Really, it's not vertical, it's normal to the surface. The surface is horizontal, therefore that's what makes that, that vertical. So we have, in effect, one, two, three, forces here, that is a non-concurrent force system, and that means that we have three independent equations of equilibrium that might be represented as sum of forces in the x, sum of forces in the y, and sum of moments about a point. Now, on a system like this, it's probably far more likely that we'd actually look at a different set of independent equations of equilibrium. That might be sum of forces in the x, sum of moments about one point, and sum of moments about another point. 
we could also do sum of moments about three different points. That would be yet another independent set of equations of equilibrium that we could write. But we only get three independent here. And that's it. So that means at most we can only come up with or solve for, that is, three unknowns. And we have a lot more than that in this particular free by diagram. We, we know the direction of the force at E, but we don't know its magnitude. That, so that's one unknown. I don't know CX nor CY, so there's two more unknowns. And I don't know AX or nor AY, so that makes five unknowns so far in this particular uh, free body diagram. So let's turn the page and look at a free body diagram of member AB, this little strut piece that's in here. All right now, so here's another critical part when we draw free body diagrams. In the original system, the only thing we had were these two forces right here. Right? You don't see anything at A, but that only showed up when we pulled the pin. So when we pull that pin and we show the effect of AB on this big bar, AC, then when we go to, to AB, then the piece that we removed was this big bar, and we have to flip these two forces around. right? Because when we put this back together, AY going up has to be equal and opposite to AY going down, those vectorially summed to zero, like we have in the original. Same thing with AX, etc. Right now, this is essentially a two-force system. You might say, well, but I see on the page one, two, three, four forces. What do you mean? There's only two. And here's what we're talking about. All right? Well, let's write one of our equations of equilibrium and see what happens. If we were to say some moments about point B, and let's take clockwise positive, then we'd have AX times its moment arm, which would be that little distance right there. And go back to the original, you'll see that that's 30 millimeters. So 30 millimeters times AX, and then minus, well, See, this distance here is 70 millimeters, and so we'd have 70 millimeters times AY, and we'd set that equal to zero, because we're summing moments about point B, so those go through, they have no moment arm, well, I have zero moment arm, and we find out that AY over AX is going to be equal to the ratio of 30 to 70. Well, now, wait a minute. That is exactly the same ratio as this triangle. So what that tells me is, is if that angle is theta, then 30 over 70, opposite over adjacent, that's equal to tangent of theta. That says that the ratio of the y and x components of A is the same as the geometry of the line segment AB. That when I resolve A and AX and AY to a single force, they're going to have to have a line of action that is directly from A to B. Right? When we get rid of those two there's your force at A. Likewise, you can pretty easily see some of moments about A. I'm going to get the same thing here, BY times 70. Ooh, and BX times 30. Just, oh, it's going to be exactly the same scenario. They have to, those two forces will have to resolve themselves to forces along that line of action. In other words, when I look at this member, it's effectively going to be a member that has two and only two forces on it. And I'm going to know that the magnitude on one end is going to be the magnitude on the other. The only question would be then, is that member in compression or is it in 
as we would see here, that's compression, or would it be possibly in tension? There is one and only one unknown in a two-force member. Huh, how about that? Because I know the direction, that is the line of action, I just don't know yet the magnitude. That's a pretty interesting kind of thing. Right? And that's how you prove that a pin-connected member and only two, pl two pins here with no member loads, meaning no loads applied to the member itself, must be a two-force system or a two-force member. And this is the proof of that. <clears throat> we could have used any alignment of this body and it didn't even have to be a straight body. Um, the only thing about this being straight is it makes it pure compression or pure tension. Other than that, it doesn't matter here at all. It's still the same overall relationship that's going on. Right? So let's carry this on. Right? Get out the magic scissors again and we're cutting away or pulling the pin at B if you prefer that. Cutting away that that member, cutting away C D, cutting away uh, well let's see this member only goes up to D, so pulling the pin at D. Again we got DX, DY, BX, and BY. We now know that the ratio of BY to BX is the ratio of 3 to 7. We proved that before. And so note that here we can say the same kind of thing. We've got, hey, this resolves to a single force. These two must resolve to a single force. And notice I've actually already done a little bit of equilibrium here by putting BX and DX in opposite directions. And I actually, some moments about B got rid of DX because it goes through point B, BX and BY go through B. And so we only have the input force P and the DY. That's how I know the direction of DY has to be as shown. Oh, what does that say? Oh, well, I've got some of forces in the X, some of forces in the Y. I got some of moments. But notice here something. I effectively only have three forces. That really means we have that force triangle business going on here. Right? We've got P going up. We've got D being the resolution of DX and DY that, let's see, how might that go? I think maybe that might go something like this because I know that B comes downwards to the right at that 3 to 7 ratio. There's B and so D has to be going up that way. There's your little force triangle. And so note, because I know the um, line of action of B I can go do a whole bunch of interesting things here, but really this is a three force system. It is a concurrent force system. It must be laid out in this arrangement. We really only get two independent equations of equilibrium here. Right? It's only because of what I know about member AB that allowed me to know exactly what the or angle of orientation of B is going to be that actually allows me at this point to go and solve the rest of this um, in the way that it is. Right? So we really only get two independent equations of equilibrium because it's a three-force system. This has to be set up like this. It has to end up being concurrent. And you may still not be convinced about what I'm talking about. Well, here's what I'm talking about. Let's get our line of action of the P-force. We know the line of action of the B-force. And this resolution of the X and Y components at D has to pass through some fictitious point. It's, it's an imaginary point. It's real, but it's not on the body necessarily. I don't know where it's at. It's just these three forces must go through that point 
because if they didn't, because two of them certainly do, the third one, if they didn't, would have an effective moment about that point. We could never satisfy this equation here, sum of moments, if that weren't true, if we didn't end up effectively with this force triangle like we've got shown here, which is just another representation of sum of forces of the x, sum of forces of the y, and that these three have to be a concurrent force system in the end, because there's only three forces on that particular part. Right? And then finally, we come over to this last one. Again, we've got this part that we've removed out of all this. We've pulled the pin at C. We've got CX and CY opposite is how we showed it in the very first free by diagram. Right there. Okay, And then we've got the piece down here in the lower jaw pushing back. And then we got DX and DY opposite of how we showed it uh, previously. And here again, we really only have three forces. We can resolve CX and CY, resolve DX and DY, each to single forces. We really only have three forces here uh, to work with. But, you know, sometimes you want to be thinking carefully. Just because I have concurrent force system, really sum of forces X and Y, doesn't mean I can't use sum of moments. I can. And sometimes that can be really handy. Notice, sum of moments about point C would mean here, let's take counterclockwise positive, I'd have dx times this distance height-wise, which turns out to be 30 millimeters, minus e times 30 millimeters. Well, it's the same distance in this case. Set that equal to 0, and therefore the x component of d equals e. And all of a sudden, we've got the ability to do some things here that were most likely what would be asked in this specific situation. What's the force in compared to what the force out at the grip would be? This particular free body diagram may or may not be helpful. It was the most complicated one that we had of all. We recognize that AB is a two-force member, which makes this free body diagram now much simpler because note what happens here. P can be related to what? It can be related to dy, but because now I know what the relationship between dx and dy is going to be by following through the geometry here, I can then figure out, right, I can find, we can sum moments about point B. Hey, let's do it real quick. Take that positive, we'll have that equals P times that distance of 100 millimeters and then dx goes through, so that's gone, so we'll have minus 30 times dy is equal to zero. So that's how we're going to find dy. dy is equal to 100 divided by 30 times p. It gets bigger. And then we got to figure out what dx is. Well, if I know dy and I know p, I know by, I know what the relationship is between by and bx, I can there find, find bx, and then therefore I can find dx. It's a long way of just doing the force triangle that we have down here, but that's what you would do, some version of all that. And now I know dx, so therefore now I can find e. It all fits together. right? And we see in this example then multiple instances of this notion of free by diagram, right? that we're isolating a body or a portion of a body from all else, but when we remove that other stuff, we have to put the forces that that something else would have imposed. And so, gee, that's when we pull that pin, and that's what we were doing in these free body diagrams, only pulling at the pins. Well, hey, you know, we've got nothing but uh, X and Y components all over for those forces that we're showing. We have special instances of what that would mean in a two-force member. We have equilibrium implications of what happens with a three-force member that makes life potentially really nice and easier for us. All kinds of wonderful, important things that make the equations easier to write by judicious selection of these free body diagrams.